Let's open in a word of prayer. Lord, uh, thanks for the day. Pray that you bless our time together today. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I didn't know what to title this thing today, so as I was walking up here, this seemed like an intelligent commentary to put in my title. I'm no biologist, but because we see, it, it, it appears that we live at this time where people are, well, they're not losing their minds. They have lost their minds. And people have lost the ability to reason. And the, the state of politics, particularly in America, is so... Um, it's so divisive. Everything is a, a big fight and a big argument. And I'll talk a little bit today about some political issues. I'll talk about some cultural things, some things in the church that kind of relate to that. And then uh, we'll talk a little bit about Israel and the Middle East and what uh, what's going on and how that might affect it. We'll talk a little bit about that war in Ukraine, although that's very hard to figure out what's going on there at times. So uh, here's some of the channels that we're on. We talk each week about the convergence of events and how things seem to be happening more quickly that are related to Bible prophecy. Now, I want to be careful. I don't want you to think that um, everything is a fulfillment of prophecy. Um, I, I don't think it is. It's just that there are a lot of things that are setting things up, uh, setting up the conditions for the world that is prophesied about. And there has to be a foundation laid that's part of what we talk about, the acceleration, converging, the convergence, the logistics, and the understanding. And that as we get closer, Scripture does tell us that none of the wicked shall understand. Now, do we live in a world where it seems that there are wicked people? And does it seem like a lot of the wicked people don't understand? And that's, that's a fulfillment of Romans chapter 1. People lose the, God gives them over to a reprobate mind as a judgment. They lose the ability to reason. Even people who should be smarter than they seem to be. But it says, the wise shall understand, and it also says in Daniel chapter 11, they that understand shall instruct many. So we want to be wise people that understand. So we, we do look at the scriptures, we look at what's going on in the world, we look at what's going on in the Middle East and that type of thing, and we understand this. And as I mentioned first hour, I did teach first hour on shouting, uh, on the triumphal entry, shouting the right thing at the wrong time. And we seem to have a lot of people that are doing that in the church today. But, you know, we have these four horsemen now, there's a dispute in Bible prophecy. Some people think that these seals representing the horsemen have been opening for some time. That's not my conclusion. We'll know as we get further down the road here. Uh, others think, like myself, that they're going to happen in a end period of time. But there's going to be, in my view, there's a crescendo. The things talked about in the first seal happen over a period of time, and they reach a peak just like the second seal, the red horse, the uh, black horse, the third seal, and the pale horse, the fourth seal. They don't, the seal doesn't open, and you know, there's hunger throughout all the world. There's, there's a, a build-up to that. And we live at a time where, you know, where you'll see people are talking about there may be famine coming. Uh, there's going to be a lot of hunger in parts of the world. So let's look a little bit at culture. This was an article in the Daily Mail. It's always interesting to me that the papers in the UK, and they have agendas just like everybody else, but they seem to cover a lot of things that happen in the US that the US papers just don't even talk about. Like, it's just not mentioned, so I guess it, it didn't happen. So Daily Mail has this, and there was a a debate, a discussion that took place at Harvard Law School, supposedly the best law school in the country or one of the two best. And, you know, and when you get into Harvard, you have to be smart. Um, uh, listen, I've worked with people from Harvard. I've had cases against people with Harvard, cases with people from Harvard. And I'll be honest with you, 
I don't know that they're smarter than anybody else. They think they are a lot of cases. And sometimes they don't work very hard. Uh, that's also true. So it's a, it's a mixed bag. So I'm not denigrating anybody that I know that went to Harvard or anything. I'm just saying my observation is that they're like everybody else. There's some lawyers that work hard. I used to work with a lawyer. He bragged that I graduated next to last in my class at Ohio State, and I've been a successful lawyer. And he had been. He was, he was right on that. And it was like nobody... Well, I had an interview with a big law firm um, in Chicago, and the first question the guy asked me, I, gee, I see you're ranked in the top 10, you know, top 10 of your law school class, but what did you get on your LS, LSAT, your law school admission test? And I mean, I kind of chuckled at him. I never got a, a call back on that interview, by the way. Like, what does that have to do with anything? Look what I'm doing. Does it, make, does it make any difference? I got into law school, and now I'm doing well, apparently. I'm fooling them, at least, so far. But they had a debate between a conservative and a liberal, and it related to this trans issue. And there was a group of law school students at Harvard that came and disrupted the thing, so they called the police. And the police came and removed... Not the people disrupting things, they removed the conservative speaker for her protection, I guess. And then the liberal law school professor who was moderating this debate, she said, listen, law schools are in crisis, the truth doesn't matter much, the game is to signal one's virtue. And she went after what is called here the woke mob at the free speech event. And she says the future of the rule and the law in the U.S. is in crisis. And I'm telling you the future of the rule of law in the world is in crisis. And so we have now, we have a candidate who's being examined at Congress, at the Senate, to see if she will be confirmed as the next Supreme Court Justice. Stephen Breyer's retiring, so they have nine justices, and uh, Judge Jackson, Contingy Brown Jackson, I think is her name. And she was asked a question, this question at her hearing this week. The definition for the word woman. Can I provide a definition? Mm -hmm. No. Yeah. I can't. You can't? N not in okay. this context. So I'm you not believe a biologist. The meaning of the word woman is so unclear and controversial that you can't give me a definition? Well, now, so who, who has got excoriated in the press? Senator Marsha Blackburn for it. Why would she even ask that kind of a question? We all know what a woman is. Do we? In the world today, you people at CNN and MSNBC, you people who came out and said the Hunter Biden laptop is a fake. And here are 41 high-ranking security people in the government that say it's fake. Now, wait a minute. This guy, Tony Bobolinsky, went on Fox and other outlets and said, hey, all those emails that people found on there, I got them from Hunter Biden. Same email address. I got everything else from him when we were in business together. Joe Biden came Tesla out. Solar and a power wall for no cost. Me. I'll tell you, these, that phone is so sensitive. So anyway, so everybody rejected it. And now the New York Times came out last week, buried in the 24th paragraph on page 20. I showed you a, a screenshot of it last week saying, oh yeah, we've authenticated those emails. Joe Biden came out before the election and said, my son Hunter is an honorable man, and he wouldn't do any of that. So what does that tell you? Joe Biden is a big, fat liar. And it, it may have changed the election. So Judge Jackson is no biologist, but... So let's get a biologist. This is on, I think it's a question time on BBC... And they actually had a professor who is a biologist. 
Now, the subject came up in the context of an argument about free speech because a professor in the UK had been terminated because she had discussed this issue, just like J.K. Rowling. They didn't even invite her to events related to the Harry Potter movies because she came out and said, a woman is a woman. Stop this nonsense. And she's being canceled all over the place. So here's Professor Robert Winston on BBC Quick Time. They'll ask him a question and then he will respond. And he is a biologist. I'm interested in your view, given that you were Vice Chancellor of Sheffield Hallam, weren't you, for, for some time. I mean, this you've mentioned Kathleen Stock, and, and that's an, a trans uh, issue. But obviously, academic freedom has, has been talked about in a number of areas I was, in recent I was, I years. I was rather hoping that you'd be interested in my opinion as a biologist, which is, seems rather more important. Because I say well, something. I'm just saying it, well, only because the issue well, of academic freedom isn't solely uh, I'm about to say something which will mean that you'll probably want to edit the programme when I finish. But oh, basically... Okay. Right. Okay. I, We're I all braced say, for I will, it. I will say this categorically, that you cannot change your sex. Your sex actually is there in every single cell in the body. You have a chromosomal sex, you have genetic sex, you have hormonal sex, you have all sorts of different kinds of psychological brain sex, they're all different. And we are very confused about this, unfortunately, and, and regrettably, it's got into this argument that people are now, would, will now accuse me of being transphobic. Well, obviously there are trans people who say you absolutely can do that. Well, unfortunately, you can't say this publicly. This is one of, this is one of the big problems. Even saying, saying this on this program undoubtedly will result in my getting a huge amount of hate mail. It always does. But I, 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 I do think it's, it, it's a big issue about the attitudes. There are, of course, issues which are important about young people who are confused about their sex, but we won't go down that route here. But it does affect a whole lot of issues in schools and elsewhere in our society. Of course we should accept people as they are. Overall, I think it's a very sad thing that we can't discuss biological science without actually getting completely caught up emotionally with something which is really completely wrong. Well, as I say, there are, there are, there are people who, who would vehemently disagree with you, so I'm just going to yes, make, make that clear. So did you see what she did? Like, oh, I, I know what he's going to say. Brace for this. And then he gave the scientific fact. So last week I showed you a picture of USA Today, Woman of the Year. And uh, it's a man who claims to be a woman. Babylon B's been banned off Twitter because they put up, they named that person Man of the Year in sort of a satirical thing. The problem, Babylon B's going to go out of business because... The world is so weird now that satire doesn't really work anymore. And so Babylon B said, well, if you delete your tweet, we'll put your account back. And Seth Dillon, the head of the Babylon B, says, well, I'm not, I didn't do anything wrong. It was satire. It's called humor. And I don't know if they'll ever be back. So we know that there was also a six foot four inch trans woman who won the NCAA 500 meter freestyle swimming championship recently at the NCAA Division I swimming championships. I think they were down in Atlanta. And a lady who's an activist, I don't know if she's a Christian or not, she's just a thinking person who says, that's, well, it's a little bit hard to hear, I'll tell you what she says afterwards, but you should be able to hear her uh, and this is, she's having a conversation with someone at the championship while Leah, now known as Leah Thomas, six foot four inch Leah Thomas, um, wins. And so here's the conversation. Are you saying you think that his body is the same as the other girls in the pool? Everybody is yes. different. No. Are you saying he doesn't have male or Are you a biologist? Are you a biologist? I'm not a vet, but I know what a dog is. <laughs> I don't know if you heard that. So she said, "I'm not a vet, but I know what a dog is." 
And then she also goes, I'm not an astrophysicist, but I know what a star and a, a mo the moon is. And she's, she's portrayed as like, well, you're an idiot because you, you believe that someone born a woman is a woman. And so they're having this big row in the UK right now about they were supposed to have an event where they were going to discuss this transgender issue. Because there were some people, there were kids put into treatment, puberty blockers, before they entered into puberty. And they seem to be a, almost like, I hate to use the word epidemic, but there's been a stunning increase in the number of them who are seeking treatment through the National Health Service over there. So the doctors said, we need to sit down and have a discussion. So they were supposed to have an event, and here's an article from the London Times yesterday, gender event off after trans activists attack extreme views, like the views of Professor Robert Winston. And one of the people that were going to speak, it's called the Cass Review, a doctor named Cass, she went through the literature and she issued this report. It's a hundred some pages long. You can download it and read it if you want. Independent Review of Gender Identity Services for Children and Young People, Interim Report, published in February. She was supposed to be one of the people speaking, and the activists came and said, we're going to disrupt the event if you invite her to speak. There are people coming that we don't, la, 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 we don't want to hear them. And this is the state of the world. Look at this graph that's from the report showing the increase from 29 to 2016 in young people seeking treatment for sex change. And Dr. Casson reports says, you know, some of these hormones and stuff, they just don't seem like they should be given to, to children, might not be a good thing. And she's, they want her block from speaking. She's a thoughtful scientist doctor. There seems to be a shutting down of science, except for Mr. I am science, who resurfaced this week, by the way, uh, to say, well, I think we need to go back to what we were doing. So we'll see how far that gets them. Here's a, this is a page that somebody sent me from um, Practices on Privilege for Home Depot, what they were instructing their employees about with regard to how people apply critical race theory. I would highly recommend, if you want to understand the foundations of this and how long it's been kicking around, I first learned of it uh, would have been the fall of 1976 in graduate school. It was my first real encounter with it in a criminology program at Indiana State critical theory uh, and how it applied to crime and that type of thing. And so here it is, it's, it's at Home Depot. It's, it's the outgrowth of critical theory. So go get a book by Michael Walsh called um, The Devil's Pleasure Palace, uh, Mar How Marx and Critical Theory is Undermining or Destroying the West, I think is the subtitle. So you have this woke stuff and it's coming into the church it's not the gospel, but people are using it like it is. And so now all these corporations are doing it. I mean, the, the examples of it are legion. And here, it happened in the NCAA basketball tournament, the women's basketball tournament on ESPN. During a game, this is what happened. This was, uh, I think, coming out at halftime, or near halftime. It was, you'll see the score in the game, and the one team was getting waxed by the a number one seed, South Carolina. But listen to what they say about this, this stuff. Well, they were talking about the bill in Florida that they say is the Don't Say Gay, gay Bill, which is designed to protect children up through third grade. So, okay, so if you don't agree third grade, how about kindergarten, first grade? Certainly you shouldn't be teaching these things to those kids. And these people say, no, 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 you have to teach them. Why? Because we... It's called grooming, it's clear. So here's two commentators, announcers on ESPN, 
uh, this week. Courtney Lyle, Carolyn Peck. Now, normally at this time, we would take a look back at the first half, but there are things bigger than basketball that need to be addressed at this time. Our friends, our family, our coworkers, the players and coaches in our community are hurting right now. And at 3 o'clock, about eight minutes ago, our LGBTQIA plus teammates at Disney asked for our solidarity and support, including our company's support, in opposition to the parental rights in education bill in the state of Florida and similar legislature across the United States. And a threat to any human rights is a threat to all human rights. And at this time, Courtney and I, we're going to take a pause from our broadcast to show our love and support for our friends, our families, and our colleagues. And so what they do is they just sit there and the, the game will go on. You'll see that uh, uh, South Carolina is winning something like 44 to 4. So they just sit there. They have a moment of silence for their colleagues who are, yeah, 44 to 4. I'm pretty sure it's the start of the second half. Look, this is just, this is just nonsense. This is a uh, Christopher Wren a Christian musician who weighed in on the Leah Thomas NCAA swim champion. However you feel about the implications for sports wider, a wider conversation for sure, calling a trans woman a man is hateful, unkind. Don't participate in this kind of speech. History won't be kind to you. They always say that, don't they? History won't be kind to you. How dare you say that? The facts aren't kind to you. Um, somebody had put that up, her, you know, winning, him winning the championship. Um, and they put up a thing about George Orwell. Now, I'm going to go back. I played a clip of Vandy Stanley a couple weeks ago, and most people were very grateful that I did that. Some people pushed back, and one couple people wrote to me, essentially said, John, if you had just listened to 30 seconds more of Andy Stanley, everything you would have seen, that everything was okay. No, everything's not okay. I'm going to go back 10 years and show you what this guy has been saying. So look, I don't, you can comment. You know, and if you're not nice, we'll delete your comment and we'll block you from commenting. But I've studied this guy extensively. Somebody wrote and said, well, you had mentioned something about an Enneagram coupon. And, you know, my pastor went to that conference and he doesn't remember that. Well, it happened. I don't care. Okay, I, look, I really try to be a fact-based guy. I do. That's, that's sort of anachronism in this world today. I know that. But I'm sorry. So here's a clip of Andy Stanley doing a thing called Between Grace and Truthy, I think was the name of the sermon. This happened 10 years ago, probably, at his church, North Point Church in Atlanta. And there was a gay couple that was attending, gay male. The male had been married to another a lady in the church and then started living with a guy. And the lady was upset. She goes, well, what? This guy's serving in the church... Well, and here, here's a little bit about it, because I think I want you to look at history. <clears throat> and somebody told me when I did this before, listen, and it just came up off the cuff. So he wasn't really prepared for how he did it. He has PowerPoint slides <laughs> to show the couples. So watch the slides. And this is not off the cuff. Stop making excuses for this. And this is just one of many. Here we go. Some months after the divorce was finalized, he shows up here at our North Point campus with his partner. And she's here. And it, it was either Easter or Christmas. I can't remember. It was a, it was, it was a big Sunday. And she is mad, mad, mad. Three syllable mad, okay? She is uh, uh, upset. She is, you know, she's like you would feel if it was you or your sister or your daughter. And it's like, and she got in his face and she said, look, this is my church. You know, you cause this problem. You go to any church you want to in Atlanta, but you can't come to this is my church. I need a worship free. I need a trauma free zone. And so you go somewhere else. And basically she kicked him and his partner out of our church. And so they left. Well, as you know, we have lots of churches in the city of Atlanta, and as it turned out, they decided to attend a different one of our churches, and it was the one that, that was closest to them, so they attended Buckhead Church. 
Okay. Well, a few weeks go by, and I'm checking on her. How's it going? And she said, that's good. You know, and we talked about the, you know, she kicked him out of the church, and how's that going, you know? And, and she said, well, the, the good news, I guess, is that they're back in church. I said, oh, great. Where? She said, they're going to Buckhead Church. She said, and then she kind of chuckled. And she said, not only that, they're serving. I said, really? She goes, yeah, they joined a host team. Now, what I knew, and I double-checked with her to make sure I was correct, was the last I, where we had left off was he my friend's partner and he's a friend now but back then not so much my friend's partner was still married and so i said to her i said now he's still married right and she said yeah the, the divorce is taking longer than, than they expect it's kind of getting dragged out so i called my buddy and said okay i know things have been awkward you know between us but look uh, and, and i'm glad you're in church that's a good thing and i'm glad you're at one of our churches you know that's a good thing but your partner, he's, he's still married. So, see, this is just good old-fashioned adultery. Like, you're in a sexual relationship with someone else's husband. Uh, you, know, it was, uh, you know, I've never said that before. But anyway, so I said, so you can't be on a guest services team, okay? This is, you're just living in, you know, this is, this is clear, okay? You can't do this. And he, you know, he, he, he's, he said, you know, I, I get this. He said, well... And, and it's funny now, it wasn't funny then. He said, well, he's married, but he's almost divorced, okay? We're all, he's almost divorced. They're at the very end. I'm like, you can't be almost divorced, okay? You're married or you're not. As long as he's married, you can't serve on a, host, on a guest services team. And so I kind of, you know, kicked him off the team. He said, well, my partner, he's going to be really upset about this because he loved the church and he loved the fact that we were going to be able to connect. I said, well, you know what? I'll, I'll talk to you if you guys want to come in. I'll, I'll talk to you about this. So they came in to see me. Now, a few weeks ago, during the Anne Rice message, I introduced some of you to a new word. The new word was disputatious, okay? Disputatious. So when they came to see me, the three of us had a disputatious conversation. <laughs> it was really, really awkward and bad. And to, the, to, our, you know, to my friend's partner's defense, it's because they showed up at Buckhead Church, and they never saw me down there except on a screen. And so he said, how can you kick me off out of a church? You're not even the pastor there. Okay. Do you see the thing here? And you saw the little thing over there, grace and truth, between grace. I think he called it between gracey and truthy or between grace and truth. But are there not standards? I, listen, I'm sure he's a nice guy, Okay. But if, if you cannot see through this junk that's being thrown out there and the confusion, this is 10 years old. I don't think it's gotten better. He's probably maybe the most influential pastor in America. This is a problem. And if you can't see the problem, you need to get with someone that can reset your discernment meter. This is not biblical. Well, they're living together, but, oh, oh, wait, he's still married? Oh, well, then that's adultery. That gives me an out. You had the out when he came out. When they came out together. And yeah, you're not the pastor of that church, so maybe a guy had a point. Listen, I've talked about this a number of times, and I could take up the rest of the time to talk about this. In Ezekiel chapter 8, Ezekiel was transported back in a vision to the temple in Jerusalem. And he's taken on a tour of the temple there. And the thing that he finds out is that he's taken further and further into the temple. What he finds is that it's the elders of Israel... <laughs> The, the, the people who should know better who are leading people down this road. It's a, it's a picture of the church in the latter times. So this is uh, Jerusalem just before the fall to the Babylonians in 586 B.C. Ezekiel sees what's going on, and, and as they go deeper and deeper into the temple, it's sort of like, and yet just come a little bit further and you'll see even more abominations. He said, furthermore unto me, son of man, verse 6, Ezekiel chapter 8, son of man, see us that what they do, even the great abominations that the house of Israel committeth here, that I should go far off from my sanctuary, but turn thee yet again, and thou shalt see greater abominations. 
And they went in, and then he says, uh, go in and behold the wicked abominations that they do there. So I went in, and behold every form of creeping things in abominable beasts and all the idols of the house of Israel portrayed on the wall round about. Then he said unto me, Son of man, hast thou seen what the ancients of the house of Israel do, the elders, every man in the chambers of his imagery? For they say, the Lord seeth us not, the Lord hath forsaken the earth. You know, we're under judgment. So God's gone, but it doesn't matter anymore. He said also to me, turn thee yet again, you'll see greater abominations. And then he go further and further into the temple. There's just this horrible stuff going on. And finally, it says this, Therefore will I also deal in fury, mine eye shall not spare, neither shall, will I have pity. And though they cry in mine ears with a loud voice, yet I will not hear them. Eventually, God gives them up. This is like Romans 1. God gives them over to a reprobate mind. Then it goes into verse 9, but there's some hope in verse 9. Pretty desperate, pretty bad. He also cried in mine ears with a loud voice, saying, Cause them that have the charge of the, the city to draw near, even every man with his destroying weapon in his hand. And behold, six men came from the way of the higher gate, which lieth toward the north, and every man a slaughter weapon in his hand, and one among them was clothed with, a, clothed with linen, with a writer's inkhorn by his side, and they went in and stood beside the brass and brazen altar. And the glory of the God of Israel was gone up from the cherub, whereupon he was to the threshold of the house, and he called to the man clothed with linen, which had the writer's inkhorn by his side. And the Lord said unto him, Go through the midst of the city of Jerusalem and set a mark. Hmm. But this is a good mark. Okay, who gets the mark? Set a mark upon the foreheads of the men that sigh and cry for all the abominations that be done in the midst thereof. So my question to you is, do you sigh and cry when you see this stuff? Particularly when you see it happening in the church. I hope so. That's a good sign. Uh, you can go look up my Ezekiel chapter 23 thing. By the way, the mark at the time was the letter Tav, and it was written like this. Hmm, that's interesting. In fact, you can go to see, look some of the ancient manuscripts, and you will see in there these letter Tav marks. Interesting. I'm sure it's just a coincidence, is it not? Okay, so let's look at some of the cultural stuff that's going on. That's a picture of an old manuscript. And that was the mark. That's how they made that letter Tav at the time of Ezekiel was written. I don't think that's a coincidence, by the way. So, I'm not saying take the mark of the beast. <laughs> but there is a mark. God does seal people that believe in him. And one of the indications in Ezekiel is if you sigh and groan. Just like the days of Lot in Second Peter, it talks about Lot. What was Lot? He was, he was uh, distressed by what he saw going on around him in Sodom. That's a good thing. Okay, now you need to share the gospel with those people. Okay, so here's, I'll just talk, this is, we're going to talk a little bit about New World Order. Larry Fink, I don't know if you know who he is, he's the head of BlackRock. It controls more money, $10 trillion in investments than most countries on the planet. And he's very influential on in Wall Street. He's a big promoter of this ESG environment, uh, uh, society and governance, social and governance issues that's just tearing apart capitalism. But he says, good thing is this Ukraine war that's finished off globalization. But I don't think he believes it. I think he's just saying it. And I'll talk just a moment about this uh, stuff that's coming, uh, CBDCs. You need to get used to that. It's ID-based, digital ID-based. It's digital currency. Um, and here's Biden talking this week to a business roundtable, and here's what he had to say. You know, we are at an inflection point, I believe, in the world economy. 
not just the world economy in the world it occurs every three or four generations as one of my, as the uh, one of the top military people said to me in a secure meeting the other day 60, 60 million people died between 1900 and 1946 and uh, since then we established a liberal world order and that hadn't happened in a long while a lot of people died but nowhere near the chaos and now is a time when things are shifting we're going to there going to be a new world order out there and we've got to lead it and we've got to unite the rest of the free world in doing it well you know i wonder how much he understands what he's saying but he put out an executive order a couple of weeks ago on cryptocurrency it's um it's a troubling um it's a very troubling article um or a very troubling thing that he did the um i want to make sure i have the right article here well biden just put out a new digital currency the hill has an article on it as well as why you should be really worried about it oh yeah, i do have that article and it's they're studying it but they talk about programmability like it's this social credit system so they'll be able to turn your money on and off like they're turning off the russian money right now and this is an article at the hill the coming federal coming federal weaponization of banking the largest shakeup in finance since the formation of the federal reserve back in 1913 is nearly here. The establishment of a government-backed cryptocurrency is a threat to the freedom of commerce and would give Washington the ability to weaponize banking against political dissent or even black Americans from accessing their own, or even black Americans, I'm sorry, black Americans from accessing their own money altogether. It happened in Canada. Now they're doing it with Russia. Uh, physical currency likely will be phased out entirely over time in favor of a digital format controlled by the Federal Reserve. Janet Yellen, who's the Treasury Secretary, now you want her? She was with the Federal Reserve. You want somebody like that controlling everything? Ubiquity of cell phones and scannable codes will make integration of a digital currency under some form of blockchain, the blockchain relatively easy to implement. Government regulations could block or track certain transactions with no trial or public recourse. Even worse, if you were placed on a list by a federal bureaucrat, not a judge, your access to banking and credit cards could potentially be shut off without a warrant or trial. And we started this after 9-11. Now they're coming out, you know, they had the vaccine passports. Just look at what's happening in China. Um, it would also allow the Federal Reserve to create trillions of dollars with the click of a button. It's, um, it's a very troubling thing that's happening. Here it talks about Canada. Look at this. Think this all sounds far-fetched? Look just what's... <laughs> just look at what's happening in China. Beijing's social credit system punishes malcontents with restrictions on internet use and travel closer to home. Canada used its emergency acts to effectively shut out supporters of the Freedom Convoy. Single moms making minimum wage lost access to their money for donating as little as $50 to the truckers. The Canadian government shut down more than 200 bank accounts and more than 250, 250 cryptocurrency addresses and threatened to suspend the protesters' insurance coverage. So Justin Trudeau went to the EU Parliament this week. He was received... He got sort of a standing ovation, but here's one member of parliament who got up and said this. Thank you. Based on Article 195, I doubt that it would have been more appropriate for Mr. Trudeau, Prime Minister of Canada, to address this House according to Article 144, an article which was specifically designed to debate violations of human rights, democracy, and the rule of law, which is clearly the case with Mr. Trudeau. Then again, a prime minister who openly admires the Chinese basic dictatorship who tramples on fundamental rights by persecuting and criminalizing his own citizens as terrorists just because they dared to stand up to his perverted concept of democracy should not be allowed to speak in this house at all. Mr. Trudeau, you are a disgrace for any democracy. Please spare us your presence. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. 
There were a number of others that did it too. Here's what the article, this is an opinion piece at the Hill. The Biden administration has less than three years left to put in place most of the most formidable ba central banking operation in a century at the expense of personal liberty. And it's troubling. Uh, here is, uh, but now the Office of the Controller of the Currency, to be fair with it, is pushing back. They've come out and said, no, no, we need to have a fair access rule. This is somebody in the government who's doing this in response to Biden, and they're saying, um, it says, uh, the rule would generally prohibit the bill that they, the rule they want to put in place, the controller of the currency, control of the currency, would generally prohibit national banks and federal savings associations with at least $100 billion in total assets from denying financial services to corporate entities. How about all of them? Business nonprofits or individuals solely on a subjective basis and would set standards to impartially evaluate customer risk. They emphasize that the OCC's longstanding supervisory guidance that banks should avoid termination of broad categories of customers without access, assessing individual customer risk remains in effect. And what they're doing is they're trying to shut down oil exploration firms and that type of thing. This is Larry Fink at BlackRock. He's doing this, tearing it down. Thinks he's Mr. Big. He is Mr. Big. But who elected him? Who elected him among the shareholders of the companies that he's controlling through these investments? He's not the shareholder. He's representing shareholders. Something needs to be done about this. But then you start researching it, and you come up with this UN Environmental Program Finance Initiative uh, for U UN Environmental Program Finance Initiative member banks. They have these things, this analysis that you do. There are things that you're supposed to do. Impact and target centering, look at their customers, stakeholders, governance, culture. This is, this is the woke stuff being implemented by the UN things worldwide. Back to the Hill, it says this, if you don't want your $20 Freedom Convoy or Black Lives Matter donation auto-flagging you as a domestic terrorist, speak up now or forever lose your ability to do so. Once the genie is out of the bottle, you will not be able to put it back in. And this at CNBC, the second Cold War is already beginning and many of the battles are being fought with economic weapons. We're in the Third World War, folks. We are in the Third World War. It's, you're going to see cyber attacks. You're going to see people shutting people out of the banking system. It's interesting. This is Eric Schmidt on the left, who used to be one of the founders of Google, still owns multi-billions of dollars of their stock. He did... A presentation. Now, this is from the Intercept, a left-wing anti-capitalist uh, paper, but it's it's actually a pretty good article, uh, blog post or article. And even on the left, people are saying, "Wait a minute, what are these guys doing? They're they're putting in this stuff." And so here's some slides from Larry Fink or from uh, Eric Schmidt's presentation on this. That was they they tried to adopt. Como tried to adopt in New York. And he talks about social credit. Now, he talks about the fact, well, you know, this social credit, it's really not that big a deal. They're not doing a very good job of it in China. And we should watch, we should be careful that it's going to become uh, draconian. The government could start scoring citizens based on demographic profile and predicted future actions, effectively predictive policing. He warns against it, but he's out there supporting it. In the press and politics of Europe and America, AI is painted as something to be feared. Yeah, that it is eroding privacy and stealing jobs. Yeah. Conversely, China views it as both a tool for solving major macroeconomic challenges in order to sustain their economic miracle and an opportunity to take technological leadership on the global stage. And well, who are all the tech companies bowing to? China. <laughs> Who did Justin Trudeau think is this great dic dictatorship? China. So, and they talk about they're using start smart cities. This is something from the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Um, so this article is from a couple of years ago at The Intercept. I used to run Google, Schmidt said. Silicon Valley could lose to China. Schmidt called for an unprecedented partnerships between government and industry. And once again, sounding the yellow peril alarm. But that was a couple years ago. 
Now what's our government doing? They're outsourcing constitutional violations to private business. It's unconstitutional. It's, and do you hear many people complaining about it? I mean, I do, but you know, I guess big deal, right? A lot of good that does. But this is all part of this end time system that's coming together. It's like with the swimmer that won the NCAA Women's Championship wrongly. Somebody asked the question, where is all these other competitors' dads at? I haven't heard one word out of them. Where are the men, the real men, you know, the ones with the right chromosomal makeup? I guess they had it removed. I haven't heard hardly any, of, I haven't heard, and there's a reason for it. If you speak out, your daughter gets, loses her scholarship. And she might not get hired as a job. And you could get fired from your job, too, because you're not woke. And you offend us. And we're going to cancel you. And it's happening all over the place. So this is some slides from uh, Schmidt's presentation from 2019 when he was talking about this. And it's just like, hey, you know, this is some of the things that are going on in the tech business. And look at this slide here. Look at... The guy's walking down the street with his reading his cell phone, but what's the cell phone doing? It's taking pictures of the person coming towards him walking around. And then they can take that data and tri triangulate it. Uh, this uh, German uh, paper had a, um, you know, this, this is being pushed in Ukraine too. They're, they're big on digital ID, that type of thing, Canada's doing it. It's happening all over the world, and it's, it's coming. You just need to know that it's coming. Uh, here's a picture of some people from Ukraine at the Ukraine house a couple years ago in Davos, including Zelensky, who's in the middle of that picture up there on the right. So Glenn Beck, I know, I know there's theological issues with Glenn Beck, okay? I know that, so standard Glenn Beck warning, but you know, sometimes people speak the truth when you don't agree with them. And here was he, him talking on a show recently about uh, digital dollar and the programmable daughter, dollar. It's going to be programmable. They'll be able to build stuff into it so that you have to meet certain criteria before you can use it. Here's just a couple minute clip from one of his shows. This is what happened in 2008. And our, our problem with credit default swaps is bigger than it was in 2008. I don't know if that's the piece or if it's going to be a collection of pieces, but we are going to go to a different currency. And each of us have to decide now. You have to decide now. Am I going to be a part of that currency? Because that currency is programmable. Read it for yourself. Go to the Fed or go to the Treasury. It's programmable, which means it will follow you. They can cancel it any time. They can say it doesn't work at these stores, etc., etc. And they're doing that because of modern monetary theory, which I explain in my book, The Great Reset. The second half of modern monetary theory is programmable money. It doesn't work without programmable money. But that means they can treat you like the Canadian trucker and completely cut you off. This is not the mark of the beast. It is not, but it is the technology that would allow that to happen, where you can't buy, sell, or trade unless you kneel. Well, that's what's coming. We may not be kneeling to the beast, but you will kneel. Your question that you have to answer is, are you willing to kneel or not and if not what does that mean to your life and how do you survive if you your cash doesn't work anywhere and so the question becomes you know it's sort of like well that's just a conspiracy theory right uh now conspiracy theory seems to be what you see on the news <laughs> and how many times do they come true some of them, I think, are still kind of out there. We'll see. Time goes along. That's fine. Um, 
So the World Economic Forum is central to this. They've been looking at these things. And so this is some of the things that they might be looking at to build into the programmability of currency, digital currency. It's, I just think it's coming. Um, I, it's there in a lot of places. So here's the, they did this thing, the top global risks that they had from 2007, top five global risk of likelihood, and down below, global risk of impact. So each year they issue a global risk report in advance of their meeting at Davos. And so this was back in 2020. And that was at the, before the pandemic had really started. So there wasn't much there about health risk or anything like that. And you can see how they move things around each, each year, what they think are the biggest global risk. But I'm just telling you is they're gonna take the global risk, they're gonna program it into the currency. So here's the, the next chart. And this shows the, also the impact up above and the likelihood below. I have this zoomed in already. So here's sort of like the, uh, in, the likelihood or the impact. You can see how well this is above average. This is, you can pause this and look at it. And then here's the likelihood. You know, the top 10 risk in terms of likelihood extreme weather, climate action, failure, natural disasters, biodiversity loss, human made environmental disasters, data fraud, cyber attacks, water crises, global governance failure. Wait a minute, global governance? Do we have global governance? They think that we do. <laughs> That's interesting, isn't it? 2020. Uh, asset bubbles, and then the impact they go through. And then they also have this, they have like a chart that shows how these things relate to each other. And see the big one in the middle, climate action. So they're going to be programming. You drove too much. Um, you don't need a quarter pounder. You can get by with a, a slider because it has less environmental impact. Less beef, John, and you don't need large fries, okay? Because we've got your medical records too, and maybe they're not up to snuff. Involuntary migration. Then in 2021, here was the Global Redis report, and again, you can see that they've added a couple here out to the side, digital power concentration, Digital inequality and infectious diseases now make the top global risk. And then same thing on the impact, infectious diseases. And this, this is a, you think I'm a downer? <laughs> this is from the World Economic Forum thing. Global risk 2021, fractured future. Why? Well, never let a crisis go to waste. Here's a crisis and we have the answers you just need to kneel to us. Foresight on frontier risk, uh, accidental war. Um, thank you. Uh, anarchic uprising, brain machine interface exploited. <laughs> I posted on my Facebook page, Christian Friedland, who's the Deputy Prime Minister of Canada. And she was listening to Justin Trudeau at this conference, and she's got that mask on, and she looks like she's eating oats. And she's, you know, doing this, and then as he's doing this, she's like mouthing what he's saying. So maybe he's reading off a teleprompter, and she is too. But she's like twerking, and I just said, well, maybe her neural link chip that she, she, maybe she was an early adopter of the chip, brain chip implant that Tesla's developing, or Neuralink is developing, and they're just updating. You know, it just so happens they chose to update it, the program, the software, right during the, uh, the Trudeau conference. I thought it was kind of funny, but uh, Freeland, by the way, is not the right name for that person. Collapse of an established democracy, geomagnetic disruption, gene editing for human enhancement. This is all coming. I just, I was reading a report that Schmidt, by the way, Eric Schmidt from Google helped head up defense initiative on the use of AI in defense. It's like a 750 page report. You had to read this thing. We're going to build super soldiers. It's like Marvel comic book stuff. Crazy. So here's another, this is 2021, their 
interrelated chart, how all this stuff is interrelated. The World Economic Forum loves these flow charts. And then here's their 2022 report. Uh, and again, they have their risk adopted and they also have how the risks are all interrelated. And again, climate action, uh, extreme weather, biodiversity loss, livelihood uh, crises, and social cohesion erosion. Well, that's thanks to the tech that you worship is what's caused a lot of that. Boy, it's, it's, it's bad out there. And what's coming is a food crisis. Here's the president. Well, here's a little report on China. Ukrainian or, refugees have fled often without knowing Ukraine, where their next meal will come from. Inside the country's besieged cities, food is running out. A tragic irony in a part of the world long known as the breadbasket of Europe. Ukraine and Russia are huge producers and exporters of grains and oil seeds, but many Ukrainian farmers have left the fields to fight and Black Sea ports are closed. Right now, knowing how much Black Sea actually matters in the scale of the international grain export, it's, it's going to be very, very and very bad. The war has strangled supply, with the price of wheat and sunflower seeds breaking records. And about 80% of sunflower oil comes from these two countries. So the, the impact of this crisis is worldwide. This is a disaster for struggling countries close to Ukraine. Lebanon, where the economy is already in tatters, gets most of its wheat from there. War-torn Yemen, where hunger is already a huge problem, relies heavily on affordable grain imports. The ripple effects could soon be felt even more strongly, according to this Ukrainian trade expert. It's not just some local Ukrainian-Russian war. And if you don't have another refugee crisis from those areas, which, which will be under that, this is something that the world needs to do. We need the way of ending this. The World Food Program says the war compounds the effect of COVID-19, climate change and other conflicts. It says 44 million people are already on the edge of famine and that could rise further unless it gets more funds. Better still would be an end to this and other wars. Redmond Shannon, Global News, London. Yeah, now look, this the one thing that's being exported a lot, I showed you the chart last week of... Uh, refugee flow from the Middle East and Africa to Europe back in 2015, 2016. Now we've had like more people in a month. I mean, 10% or 25% of the Ukrainian population does not live today where they lived a month ago. 4 million, 10% of the population that is not even in the country. Farmers are fighting the Russians. They're not going to plant wheat. Russia may not plant because they have, you know, and that's 40% of the world's supply of wheat right there. President Biden noted this in a speech in Europe yesterday. With regard to food shortage, yes, we did re re talk about food shortages. And, uh, and it's going to be real. The, the price of these sanctions is not just imposed upon Russia. It's imposed upon an awful lot of countries as well, including European countries and our country as well. And uh, because both uh, Russia and Ukraine have been the breadbasket of Europe in terms of wheat, for example, just give one example. But we had a long discussion uh, in the G7 with uh, um, the uh, with both uh, the United States, which has a, as a significant the third largest producer of wheat in the world, as well as Canada, which is also a major, major producer. And we both talked about how we could increase and disseminate more rapidly food, sh food shortages. And in addition to that, we talked about uh, urging all the European countries and everyone else to end trade restrictions on, on sending, uh, lim limitations on sending food abroad. And yeah, because now what they're doing is they're saying, well, we're not shipping our wheat. And the Middle East is in a major crisis. Peter Zahan, who I played a clip of last week, I, he was on I-24 News in Israel. 
the other day talking about what's what's this Russian invasion of Ukraine? How's it going to impact stuff? And Biden, I think, is dreaming if he thinks our crops are going to go up because we can't get the a lot of people can't get the fertilizer. I and mean, if they can't get it, it's tripled in price. That's going to pass on to consumers. This whole thing is just like seems to be spiraling out of control. So here's Peter Zahan interviewed on I-24 News. He's a geopolitical analyst. I think he's a pretty sharp guy. And here's what he had to say. Geopolitical strategist Peter Zahn joining us from the mountains of Colorado in the United States. Thank you very much for being with us. So first, you predicted that Russia would launch the current operation already five years ago. How did you come up with this idea? Are you a prophet? Yeah, it's, uh, I wouldn't say that I'm a magician, but I certainly have some tools that other people don't use, uh, primarily geography and demography. We've always known that if the Russians are going to survive as a people, they have to plug the gateways that countries have always used to invade them. Two of them are on the other side of Ukraine, so this had to happen. And we've always known demographically that the population has been in collapse. And this is really the last year that the Russians have sufficient forces to fuel the regular army. So it, was, it really was a now or never thing. And we've been able to see those trends for, for years now. You wrote and said that Russia had planned its operations. It seems not only for military reasons, but also for financial and therefore energy related reasons. Yeah, the whole plan, and we're going to see this over the course of the next three months, was to use energy to break apart the NATO alliance. So I think the Russians are as surprised as I and everyone else are that the Europeans have been so tight when it comes to sanctions to this point. But in the not too distant future, most of the pipelines that go through Belarus and Ukraine are going to go offline, either because the Russians are going to destroy them accidentally or because Ukrainian partisans are going to blow them up. Uh, when that happens, there are only two pipelines left, one which goes under the Baltic Sea called Nord Stream and one that goes under the Black Sea called Blue Stream. They go directly to Germany and Turkey. So very soon, the Russians will be able to go to Berlin and Ankara and say, look, we can keep the energy flowing for you, only for you. But there's a cost. You have to make sure that NATO can't function in the defense of Ukraine. You had already predicted in uh, 2017 that the price of a barrel would reach uh, $300. Is that still realistic? That would mean a third oil crisis. We are going to have a third oil crisis. So what we're seeing right now is roughly two thirds of the oil that the Russians export to the West via the Baltic Sea and the Black Sea has more or less left the market because insurers won't insure ships to go pick the crude up. Uh, European dock workers are refusing to unload it or ship captains are refusing to pick it up. So that's already about three million barrels a day that has been interrupted. Uh, once we fast forward a little bit in this war, once partisan attacks start, you can account on all the, the pipelines going offline as well. Uh, in that specific circumstances, we would consider ourselves fortunate to have oil at only 170. I think 200 is a more realistic number. And when that happens, President Joe Biden has the authority already to single-handedly stop American crude oil exports. And when that happens, the world loses access to Russian and American crude at the same time. In North America, we get a functional energy price of probably about 70, but in the rest of the world, it'll probably never drop below 150 ever again. And as we adjust to the new normal before we have demand destruction, I think 300 is a reasonable figure. You have also published a book with a, a very optimistic title, The End of the World is Just a Beginning Mapping of the Collapse of Globalization. Surely not good news for Israel and the Middle East. Uh, bigger, but yes. Uh, let's start with the Middle East, though. If we have an environment of very, very high oil prices, that also means very, very high agricultural prices. Don't forget that Ukraine and Russia are the world's fifth and largest exporter of wheat, and that Russia is the world's largest exporter of fertilizer. So the last time there were interruptions in the wheat market from the, the Russian space, 
Wheat prices in the Middle East tripled, and we got this series of conflicts and uprisings and coups and collapses that we now collectively call the Arab Spring. What's coming in the fourth quarter of this year will be significantly worse than that. I would be very surprised if global wheat prices did not at least quadruple, and then Middle Eastern wheat prices will be significantly above that. Uh, and that's going to hurt everybody because almost every country in the region imports at least half of the calories that they consume, Israel included. Uh, that's going to take some adjustment. But these effects are global. This is not a regional thing. So you can count on the countries in the Middle East that can still get their crude to market, all of a sudden having a lot more money to play with. That's going to be great probably for places like Saudi Arabia. Uh, but you can also count on global energy restrictions forcing certain countries that are not in the Western Hemisphere to go out and take matters into their own hands. So I would be very, I'm expecting countries like the, uh, Britain and France, uh, maybe Denmark, maybe Spain, maybe Germany, maybe Italy, adventuring into the African continent to cut direct deals with the oil exporters there to prevent the crude from going anywhere except for to Europe. Uh, that will allow them to take some of the sting out of this high global energy price. But if you're a country that used to rely on African crude, and I'm thinking China here, you're talking about the worst possible constellation of factors. Peter Zayn, thank you so much. So we have a um, problem. We had Iran hitting a, a base in Erbil with uh, some missiles recently. Uh, China's you know, joining in with Russia. Um, kind of an interesting alliance. Uh, Russian citizens are leaving. Uh, thing, it, everything is just sort of really spinning. The Russian... Um, um, invasion seems to be bogged down a little bit. Uh, this is talking about tech totalitarians are on the march with the cryptocurrency and that sort of thing. Uh, let me jump ahead here. Uh, let's see what this... Oh, well, this is the Pope. The Pope did what he said he was going to do. Uh, the other Last week he consecrated the world to the heart of Mary. Let's talk quickly about uh, Ukraine. Um, you know, this is... Um, well, this is the presidential um, rule on cryptocurrencies, the study document. So this is... Uh, oh, this some other things going on in the Middle East. So last February, a year ago, Israel... Uh, I'm sorry, in February, Israel attacked this year, last month, they attacked a drone base inside Iran. So you're going to see these attacks back and forth between Israel and Iran. Uh, they said that they destroyed hundreds of drones, but drones are relatively cheap to rebuild. And with the way the negotiations are going in Vienna on the new Iranian nuclear deal, Iran could end up with $100 billion dollars. They can, they can cause some damage with $100 billion. So here's a picture before and after of the UAV atta the attack on the drone base in Iran. Um, this is kind of an interesting article. Uh, this is a war reporter who was in Ukraine, and he just said, um, listen, you know, I think Russia's wrong for going in. But I think Zelensky is a salesman, and he's lying a lot. So I don't really trust him. Um, let's see here. Russia is doing these really nasty attacks on Mariupol, which is a city on the uh, coast down um, near the Crimean Peninsula. Uh, they effectively control the coast, but so here are some pictures. This is what this is what um, Russia is doing. I mean, they are leveling cities. Now you're going to get a lot of propaganda out of this. They'll say, "No, no, no. This is where the neo Nazis were hiding out, so we had to bomb their apartment buildings." So here's this is a drone video of just some of the areas in Mariupol. 
the word that I get, it's so hard to get information that you can trust. The reports that I'm seeing are that over 20,000 people in Mariupol have been killed. They are leaving in convoys of vehicles. Some of those are being shot at. And you can see the buildings are just destroyed. So people have no place to live. So they're, they're turned into refugees. And this is a very well-known Russian tactic. Uh, they did this to Grozny back in the around 2000. They went in and they just destroyed the city. Like 90% of the city was destroyed. Now they'll show pictures of Grozny. Well, Grozny's really come back and it's, it's really doing well. But you see the cities. This is a drone of Aleppo from a few years ago from the BBC. And you can see that in Aleppo, 40% of the city was destroyed. They're saying that maybe 70% of Mariupol is destroyed. Aleppo was Syria's largest city. And these were largely Sunni neighborhoods, and they wanted to get rid of them because they were considered a problem to the Assad regime. And so they just took them out. Here's another picture of Mariupol in Ukraine. A month ago, this didn't look like this. You know, people had... Um, and then you get all these different opinions. A month ago, people had regular lives, relatively regular lives. And now there's all these questions like, is Russia going in? Are they going in further? Are they going to back? It's hard to say because there's so much propaganda out there. The Ukrainian troops are running out of weapons. They did attack a Russian uh, ship in a port. They are fighting back in some towns, but ultimately, I just don't think that they can um, stand up to the Russian forces. This guy called the Butcher of Mariupol, uh, he was the one who led the thing in Aleppo, and I just showed you a picture of Aleppo. So this is, it's going to go on for a while, but then it's, it's cost Russia. Russia doesn't have a huge economy they're going to be in financial trouble. The question is, are some people, some people are quitting, some people are living, leaving Russia, is Putin going to survive? At the same time, you have Baby Kim is now putting out missiles that can reach the United States. The Iranians are doing the same thing. The Taliban in Afghanistan, where we retreated, I don't know how else to describe it, we fled. Taliban said, oh, we'll let the girls go to school. Guess what they're doing now? Uh, no, they can't go to school. Nobody's going to do anything. It's affecting the economy. Biggest fall in living standards since the 1950s. And here's some pictures from, uh, these are pictures from Grozny back in 2000. Uh, they had a problem with uh, Chechen rebels. They went in and they just leveled. Look what they did to the city. I mean, that looks like Syria. It looks like parts of Mariupol and other cities in Ukraine right now. Uh, there, is a, there was a warlord that was fighting the Russians, but then he and his son converted, came onto the Russian side, and now the younger one has been filmed. I don't know if he's in Ukraine, but they, his, his rebels, his uh, private army has been set to, sent to Ukraine. Syrian... Fighters are being given $1,000 a month to go to Ukraine and fight. This guy is a, um, a, a Muslim. Here's a picture of a panel in his palace. And you can see in the background, you can see how Grozny's been rebuilt into this modern city. And I think that when Putin went into Syria, he had that in mind that Russia was going to benefit from rebuilding Syria. But that ha doesn't happen. And in the midst of an economic crisis, it's not going to happen. Now you layer on top of that, wheat prices going up, food shortages, and as Peter Zane said, it looks like we're going to have something much worse. And it's going to be worldwide. This is, this is the panel in the home at Grozny, in Grozny that this Chechen warlord, he, I guess he's the dictator in charge down there now, his name is um, Katarov. That's his father on the right who died, and then he succeeded to power a few years later. Here again, this is Mariupol. A Russian general was killed. I think he's the fourth one. And everybody says, well, we'll shut down Russian 
supply, you know, Russian fuel, fuel supplies, right? How's that going? Here's a graphic from this morning's Washington Post. Huh. Seems like Russian oil's still getting out. Well, that doesn't seem to be shutting him down. And, and what they're saying is Europe's buying the fuel at higher prices, and they're financing Putin's war. This is an uh, interview with Putin from uh, a few years ago, at the Financial Times. And they talked about a speech that he gave at Zavos. And so what they asked him is, do you evaluate the risk before you do these things? And they did ask him, you can get it on YouTube, you can find it. Um, and they asked him, does your appetite for risk increased? And Putin just doesn't rattle off an answer. He's a kind of a thoughtful guy. Now, I don't like the way he thinks. I don't agree with him. I think he's a thug. Risk must always be well justified, he said. But this is not the case when one can use the popular Russian phrase. He who does not take risks never drinks champagne. This is not the case. And he went on to talk about what's going on in Syria. Here's a map of Ukraine. The orange areas are the areas of Russian control. They're surrounding Kiev. I, I don't know how well it's going. It's so hard to get information. This is a graphic from today's London Times. And it says, outfoxed, outfought, and, and now the Russian invaders are outnumbered. I don't know that that's true. There was a publication on a Russian website the other day that they had sustained. They say they have, you know, like 1,300 troops that have been killed, but this showed about 16,000. It was immediately taken down, but a lot of people grabbed s screenshots. And it's just, it's like what, what, it is a very difficult situation. Uh, here's another, I'll just play a minute or so of this, of, uh, Peter Zane, another interview that he gave on a business program. I just think the guy's a good thinker, and I think he's one that somebody... Uh, this was to. always inevitable. Uh, in, in any world where the United States is no longer banning war and is no, no longer regulating commerce in the way that we did during the Cold War and the post-Cold War period, uh, the Russians were always going to go out and try to resecure what they see as the gateway invasion access corridors, uh, places like the Polish Plain, the Bessarabian Gap, uh, the Baltic Sea. They were always going to try to do this. Uh, what has changed is that the Russians are literally dying out. And the post-Cold War generation that was born through the 1990s was so small that the Russians were losing the capacity to field a regular army. So if they didn't do it now, they would lose the possibility and they would be then unanchored in this kind of great open flat zone in your, the middle of Eurasia. And the next time there's a war, they couldn't stop it. So they're hoping to forward position what they've got left in these gaps. And Ukraine, unfortunately, is between them and two of the most important gaps. So it's not just that they're going for Ukraine. They're going for Moldova. They're going for parts of Romania and Poland and all of Estonia and Latvia and Lithuania. It's just a question of timing. Uh, but Ukraine is the flavor of the month. Uh, I kind of see this war as the last conflict of the Cold War. Because as long as the Russians existed, uh, and it, their security was going to drive their decision making. So it's kind of like how the Civil War was the final war of the American Revolution. We're kind of at the end of this section of history now. When you think about what's happening uh, kind of on the ground, and of course, I, I always am careful to say, like, we don't really know what's happening. We can just go off of the reports that we're getting. Uh, sure. It seems like... Uh, Russia may have thought that they would uh, be able to be successful in U Ukraine much quicker than they have been. So I think they've been a little surprised by the resistance that they've faced. And also it appears that uh, they may have thought that China or other countries were going to have much more support for them than it appears that they do. Is that a fair categorization in terms of uh, maybe uh, some assumptions that Russia had going into it and they've been surprised by the lack of success or support that they've received? Absolutely. Uh, one of the things we've seen in a lot of the authoritarian governments that are in existence right now, most notably Russia and China, is that their leadership is completely isolated themselves from the rest of the world. And so if you are not, if you are in Putin's inner circle, you don't dare give him bad news because he will kill you. So there were a lot of assumptions that were made in the Kremlin that just have turned out to not be true. Now, in 
all due defense to, to Putin and the Kremlin, everyone in the West was thinking the same way. We never thought that the Europeans would pull together in the way that they did. We never thought that we would get any sort of meaningful international sanctions that included countries like Japan and Korea. We thought that the Ukrainians would crumble. We thought that the war would be over in a month. You know, everyone has gotten it wrong. But from my point of view, the single biggest flaw is the complete collapse institutionally of the Russian military. They are making mistakes that were worse than what the Iraqis did in 1992 or what they themselves did during the Chechen Wars. Just the, the inability of them to launch any sort of meaningful multi-domain operation in what we thought of as the second most advanced military in the world is just blows your mind uh, and forces the Russians now to do siege mentality tactics where they just obliterate civilian infrastructure because now that's the only way they can win the war. So that's, you can find, just uh, Google his name and or search his name in YouTube and you'll come up with a ton of interviews. This is what the Pope did. He consecrated uh, Russia and Ukraine to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. This is what he said he was going to do. He did it on March 25th, which is on the Catholic calendar is the day of the Annunciation, where Mary was you know, visited by the angel and told that she would be with child of the Holy Ghost. I, I have to tell you, I just... Um, and you always see Christ on the cross, and this is at St. Peter's in Rome. And the, how do I say this without being harsh? Just the rank idolatry that's involved in this. To fulfill this supposed prophecy from 1917. And uh, you'll see there's, there's pictures of, I mean, they have these close-ups of this statue of Mary, and then he's praying to the statue, and then everybody comes by. And the interesting thing is, they go to Mary, but they don't go to Jesus. Uh, here's at the end of this, you can, you'll see how everybody's kind of, uh, see how they're kind of all gathered over there by Mary? It, it just, it really bothers me. Uh, there is a big, this is an important thing that's going on, a meeting today with uh, representatives from Bahrain, Morocco, and the United Arab Emirates in Israel, Arab countries in Israel meeting to have this. A uh, historic summit that's taking place. They had some meetings with Egypt earlier in the week. Uh, I'd recommend that you go get Caroline Glick's article. She talks about the fact that uh, she bases it on an article by David Wormser at the Jewish News Syndicate, The Bride of the JCPOA and America's Regional Collapse. And what he talks about is the fact that what's going on is the Arab countries, and this is a historical channel that, that did some pretty good videos, about the development of Arabia. And you see all those tribal areas, and they have that today. And there's a tribal relationship that happens, and what, what happens is that if, if you're not the strong guy, the tribes will go seek strong guy elsewhere. It's a, it's a tribal culture. And so David Worm Wormser's article is based on, okay, it's time for the United States to step up and become this. He says this, the tribal essence is intertwined with early Islamic history and ties directly to the Prophet Muhammad. One cannot disassociate Islam from its historic origins or Arab roots. Muhammad, whose message threatened the powerful tribal aristocracy of Mecca and could live in Mecca safely, as long as his powerful uncle, the leader of his clan, extended his protection over him after his parents died. However, the moment that his uncle died, Muhammad was essentially served a death warrant and he had to flee to Mecca. And he says, this is what you're seeing now with the United States drawing back in the Middle East, that everybody's looking for the stronger horse. So that's why the Arab countries, and I think Trump saw this, 
uh, working with Netanyahu and others, saw that this strong horse thing was a, a, a big thing and that we needed to be a strong horse in the Middle East and we could bring people together. Now, I've also heard that uh, Jared Kushner is in Israel right now. I don't know if he's participating in these meetings, but he has that Arab Peace, Arab Abraham Accord Peace Institute that he's pushing. Uh, so I would, I would recommend that you go and you get um, David Wormser's article at Jewish News Syndicate on the JCPO, JCPOA and also Caroline Glick's article on um, from Israel Helm. Go to carolineglick.com and listen to her podcast this week. She talked to Todi Badrin, who wrote an article about a year ago with Michael Duran called Realignment, how the Biden administration is realigning everything in the Middle East. And they're, they're just capitulating to Iran. It's very troubling. And so the Arab countries are going to enter into, I think, peace agreements with Israel. They're looking for a stronger horse. That's why when Biden calls the Saudi Ra Saudis, they don't take his call. And at the same time, Iran is building up their missile capability all the time. So they're having, uh, so Caroline, I think, is very right in what she says that, um, Israel needs to be strong, and she's concerned that Israel might not be strong. And then this article from a few weeks ago in the tablet. Said this. It's kind of interesting in the context of everything. Russia's next target for intimidation could be Israel. As Moscow slides into global pariah status, it will want to upgrade ties with its closest allies on NATO's southern flank, Syria and Iran. And Putin would do this. He would do this. He would evaluate the risk and say that's a risk worth taking. Look at what this article says. So what might be the repercussions for Israel of its public anti-Russian stance, however mild? There is no doubt that Russia is looking to flex its muscles in Syria where there is uh, where it's built an impressive military presence. As Russia slides into uh, prior, pariah status the in, in the international arena, it will want to upgrade its ties with its closest allies in the region. There is little doubt that fateful events in Ukraine have turned over the chessboard in the Middle East as elsewhere. While risks for Israel are bound to increase, it will need now, more than ever, firm American support and a confident U.S. policy in the Middle East. A new American deal with Iran, which remains America's regional priority, even during the war in Ukraine, seems unlikely to provide those assurances. And who is our government turning to to help negotiate the deal with Iran? Russia. It, the whole thing is just absolutely insane. So this is the article that Tony Badrin wrote with Michael Duran uh, last May in the tablet, also the realignment. And go listen to the interview that Caroline did with Tony Badrin this week and answer this question. Now, look, I know he's not in office, but I call it the Obiden administration, as do a lot of other people. I don't think he's gone away. And I asked the question, you may remember a number of times, you want to talk about Russian collusion? What did he ever do that did not benefit Russia? Tell me, send me an email. He always capitulated to them. And Syria, he let Syria go because Russia was there. Um, and so there's been a massive realignment in things that are going on. And uh, next week, I'll play for you our new ambassador to Israel saying, you know what really, well, I'll tell you what, I'll play that, I'll play this on the way out. So they did a Zoom call with uh, Peace Now, which is a left-wing anti-Israel organization. And this anti-Israel thing is being built into our own laws. In the new budget bill that came out recently, there was a whole section here. Israel Relations Act 
Normalization Act of 2022. And what did it say? The recent peace and normalization agreements between Israel and several Arab states have the potential to fundamentally transform the Middle East. But then what do they continue to push it? Well, this will enhance efforts towards a negotiated solution to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And what's our ambassador say when he's talking to his left-wing buddies at Peace Now, Tom Nidus or whatever his name is? He says this. Uh, hang on. There we go. That in any way hurts the security of the state of Israel. So I am, I am trying to do in my job, and it's not easy to do, um, but you know, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a bit of a nag on this, including the idea of settlement growth, which infuriates me when they do things that just infuriates the situation, both in East Jerusalem and the West Bank. We can't do stupid things that impedes us for a two-state solution, okay? And that, what I mean by that is, is we can't have the Israelis doing settlement growth, both in East Jerusalem or the West Bank. Listen, I can't stop everything. Just so we're clear, I'm not, and, and I have to pick my battles. Like, E1 was a disaster. I went full bore on E1. Well, he goes on to say, what really bothers me is these Israeli settlements. And then he says, it's also problematic that there are these terror attacks. And this is a headline from Jewish Chronicle in the UK, Israel, Iran masterminds Israel terror wave. Down in Beersheba, right in the heart of the city, in the center of the city, there were four people stabbed to death by a terrorist just the other day. Horrible, horrible scenes coming out of that. Uh, of course, in the Iranian, in the uh, uh, Hezbollah back paper in Iran, or in Lebanon, they're saying, ah, you know, too bad. They're kind of getting what they deserve. It's a pretty awful article. And then Iran came out, the head of the IRGC said, Israel has an expiration date. Hmm. So, as a result, you see these meetings going on, um, and then the Houthis are also attacking the, um, this is in Jeddah on the Mediterranean, or on the Red Sea. They're having a major Formula One Grand Prix here, and they're having these attacks take place. Um, well, that's going on. Lots to talk about. And by the way, I do not believe that this is the solution, this East Med pipeline. It's too far away. Maybe they can build liquefied natural gas ports and get more gas to the people there. But uh, I would recommend that you go read Seth Fransman's article in the Jerusalem Post, I think it's today, where he talks about the fact that, where did I have that? Uh, hang on. Here it is. Look at this attack from the Houthis, though. I mean, look at what they did. Um, this is, it, you think they're trying to cause an oil crisis? That's Saudi Arabia. That's a major terminal for Saudi Arabia. He says, better be careful that the Iran strike on Saudi Aramco is a sign of worse things to come. He concludes this article by saying this, Iran is showing total support for the Houthis in this battle with Riyadh. It has projected the faces of Houthi leaders on the Azad, Azadi monument in Tehran, according to photos seen online. And he's, he's right. This is, it's very, everything is very, very volatile. It's going to be a volatile world for a while. Um, I hope it's soon that Jesus comes back and deals with this. But in the meantime, we have work to do. As the church, you know, we need to warn people about these things and share the gospel. Let's pray. Lord, uh, pray that you'll bless us this week. Give us opportunities to share the gospel. Pray that you will help us to be people driven by our faith and hope in you and not through fear. And that you will give us opportunities to minister to those around us. Bless us this week in Jesus' name. Amen.